Hey Shoreline Online family, we are so glad that you're here today. And if it's your first time, I just wanna say welcome and I'm so glad that you found us. If it is your first time, go ahead and fill out a guest card so we can get to know you and get you connected. Prayer is super important to us here at Shoreline, so if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and drop them in the comments or email us at prayer at shoreline.net. We're about to go into a special time of worship, but I just wanna encourage you to receive what God has for you today and really lean into his presence. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the rest of service. Together and worship God this morning.
of difficult circumstances to change and and we're just tired of it you know or maybe even physically we get tired in life but the good news is even when we get tired God never grows weary or tired and I want to read some verses to you out of Isaiah 40 just let them soak into your heart they're so so good it says in verse 20 do you not know have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will never grow tired or weary in his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Did you know that eagles go through this process every single year called molting? Maybe you've heard this along your journey somewhere. You watch some National Geographic thing. I don't know or you remember it. But it's such a kind of a cool thing because throughout an entire year, they lose all of their feathers. And like a lot of birds do, actually. And, and during this molting process, molting is just a big old word for shedding or losing, right? They lose all these feathers and they lose the old feathers they lose the damaged feathers the broken feathers and they're replaced with these brand new fresh feathers that give them the ability to to fly efficiently right to have the strength to soar like an eagle they have this new fresh vitality and youthfulness about them now of course we don't lose feathers okay but this scripture is so clear that on an ongoing basis god is reminding us that we need to go to him to be renewed to be strengthened to be refreshed to be touched in every way in our lives that causes us to be able to soar 
And so today I was just thinking, if you have grown doubtful in your heart, you know, maybe you're just doubting everything, that God is really able to still do a miracle in your life. Maybe you're tired, maybe you're weary, maybe you're physically tired. Listen, can I just encourage you, get your cute little behind back into the presence of God and stay there. Get to this place where you are hoping in Him, where you are trusting in Him, where you are waiting upon Him to renew your strength. And as you get in that place, listen, I'm talking about a consistent and like maybe an extra amount of time, like on a Sabbath, on a Saturday, on a, 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 a time where you can just soak in His presence, allowing His grace to kind of rain upon your life like Niagara Falls. Maybe you're just soaking in the presence of God and the love of Jesus is just consuming your heart. Maybe you're just there in that place where you're trusting Him again. Listen, we've got to spend that time on an ongoing basis so that we can soar like eagles. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you are a gracious and good God. Father, you know that you have created us to come to you as our fuel. Father, you're the one, your presence, Father, your sweetness, Father, your love, your grace, your kindness, Father, completely and totally restores us. Father, strengthens us for this journey. Father, brings healing to our hearts. Father, you take all of the splinters from our hearts and you remove them. Father, you cast them out of our heart when we run to you, when we stay in that place under the waterfall of your love. And so today, God, we're asking that you would renew the strength of everyone here. Father, that they would continue to be strong in you and in your mighty power. Father, that you would use them in their families, that you would use them in their schools, that you would use them in the workplace. Father, that everywhere we go, God, we would be a light shining in the darkness. God, we need you to renew us so that we can soar like eagles. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? Jesus, to fully praise you, it will take all.
We sometimes forget why we do it as we lift up our hands and the reason we lift up our hands is because we are celebrating a victory and we just sang the words there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus and can I challenge you if you're comfortable right there where you are just to lift up your hands for a moment and just lift them up in victory and I just want to say these words over the challenges that you're facing over those things that you're trusting God for over the things that you're concerned and worried about this morning over those things that are heavy in your heart 
this morning, can I proclaim this as you proclaim this victory by lifting up your hands on high. There is no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are welcome to take your seats at this time. And I want to just welcome all of you here, whether you're in the room or online, it is fantastic to have you with us today. And if you are a middle schooler or a high schooler, you're welcome to head out those doors on your right, right now. Awesome. Who's excited to be in church this morning? Yes, God is so good. My name is Micah and this is Pastor Yuri. We'll be your host today. If this is your first time here, we are so glad that you're here today. You could have been anywhere else today, but she decided to be here. And as our way of saying, thank you for being our guest. We have a gift we wanna give you. You can head out to the lobby right after service. Some of our pastoral team, our staff, we will be in the lobby. We just wanna connect with you and get to know your name. If you haven't had a chance to fill out our connect card, do so by scanning the QR code that's on the armist on your seat. And if you prefer the paper copy of the connect card, Grab the one in the seat back right in front of you, fill it out, drop it off in the offering buckets later on in the service. And guys, we just want to um, be able to answer any questions that you might have for us about Austin, Jesus, this big God family that we call Charlotte Church. And most importantly, we want to know your story. We want to know who you are. So for if, if you are new, fill out that connect card. And say you've been coming to Charlotte Church for a while, you're like, what are my next steps? Your next steps is to be a part of our Shoreline family. And you can do that by attending our diving class that takes place on Sunday mornings. And to get more information, just scan the QR code. Well, I, I, I am about to, uh, I was just thinking about this today, yeah. is um, I met somebody today that did the, did the thing. Yeah, they scanned yeah. the code, they filled in the card, they finished the, the diving course, they started serving, and they were just testifying me to me this morning how it changed their life. So this might be your very next step. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Amen. Okay, we're, we're about to, to uh, worship God through our offering, and uh, there's a couple of ways for you to give. You can give by scanning the QR code once again, going to shoreline.net slash give, or using, using the envelope in the seat back in front of you and just doing it that way. Um, but this week was a week when a lot of us thought a lot about our finances. And the reason for that is Monday was tax day. I hope I'm not disturbing anybody by referring back to that day. But uh, the reality is that when we review our taxes, it forces us to do something. It forces us to look back at our finances. It forces us to consider our finances. And most of the time when I look back at my finances, there I find these little moments. I find these little things on my my expense reports, on the on on the things that I spent my money on. And I sometimes question whether or not all those decisions were good decisions. Is it just me? Okay, okay. I sometimes question the, the decisions Karen made and whether they were all good all the shopping. Okay. She, she's preaching down south, yeah. so I'm very brave today. But, 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 but here's the thing, is you question some things and you regret some things. But I want to tell you, as I reviewed my finances, there's two things in all the years that I've been alive that I've never regretted and I've never questioned. I've never regretted giving something away. I've never one moment regretted an opportunity that I took to sow, and I never questioned any decision that I made in obedience to God. So as you consider your finances, remember these two things. God has called us to be givers as He is a giver, and God has called us to be obedient when it comes to finances. So Lord, as we give today, may our giving, Father, may it be please you. But not only that, God, may we be joyful givers. May we tap into that joy and may we give with great joy and may we conduct every bit of our finances with the greatest reverence and the greatest obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys are welcome to send through the baskets. Yeah, at Shoreline Church, we believe in the power of prayer. And every week, our pastoral team, our staff, we gather together to pray for every individual car that comes through. So if you find yourself this week, you're in the trenches, um, life isn't meant to be done alone. So we want to partner with you. We want to pray for you. So we want you to text my prayer to 97,000. You're going to get a link where you can put in your prayer requests. And we're going to pray and believe God for whatever you're asking Him for. But church, that's all we got. We want to encourage you to turn your attention to the screen to see what's coming up here. What's up, Sharon? I'm James, and I'm here to tell you what's coming up. Calling all men of Shoreline. 
Get ready because Guys Night is happening on May 17th. Get ready for an incredible evening of fellowship, inspiration, and fun. Whether you're looking to develop your relationship with God, meet other guys here at the church, or just have a great time, we wanna see you there. Keep an eye out because registration opens soon. This is gonna be an unforgettable night, and we wanna make sure that you are equipped to grow closer to God and make a difference in this community. Mother's Day is right around the corner. And to celebrate this special day, we're gonna be having child dedications during each service. This is a fantastic way to celebrate our mothers, families, and acknowledging the gift that children are. So if you are wanting to register your child for child dedications, make sure to register now. This is gonna be a fantastic time to celebrate the mothers in our lives, the love and the gratitude that we have for them. The very best way to stay connected, inspired, and informed is to head over to their app store and download our Shoreline app. And also make sure to follow us on social media. And to register for upcoming events, head over to shoreline.net. Well, that's all I've got. We hope you enjoy the rest of service. feel like I ought to come out dancing to that music, you know. Some people who know me well shouted, no, no. <laughs> so good to have you. Welcome to Shoreline today. It's great to be together and uh, so glad that you're here. Let's all of us stand to our feet. While you're standing, I want to give a huge shout out to all of you who are watching online from around the community, around the state, around the nation. We just welcome you to our campuses here in Austin, Texas, and a huge shout out to those of you who are a part of our Shoreline Behind Bars. We had a, a record number of views this past weekend. These are uh, inmates from, uh, from all around Central Texas that are a part of our church family. And you may not know this, but uh, many of them, after they get out of incarceration, they end up coming here to church. And, uh, and we're just thrilled that they're a part of our journey and we're a part of their journey. So give them a great big hand clap as they watch us today. Great to have you. We start every uh, message with uh, our creed. It's just our way of um, kind of recalibrating our thinking. Uh, these phrases mean a lot to us because at the end of the day, Christianity is not just about how you can live a better life. It's not just about principles and ideas. It's really about God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. It's about grace. And so we, we triumph that, we announce that, we celebrate that by our Creed. And if you're new to Shoreline, you can just read along. The rest of us, we say this with some enthusiasm and passion. You guys ready? Here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give... God praise for that. All right, you may be seated. Uh, so some of you know um, this, but maybe some of you are, are new to Shoreline today. We are actually going through the book of Philippians uh, verse by verse. And uh, the, the title of this entire collection of talks is Made for More. You were made for more. God has something really great in store for you. And we're hanging out this week in the second chapter of Philippians, we're going to take the first few verses and we're going to focus in on one of the most important principles that should guide our living. We're going to talk about the importance of unity. And you will see it in this particular passage as we uh, open up here the second chapter of Philippians. You'll see the focus, the emphasis. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church at Philippi. And so you could almost Imagine it here this morning that this is God writing you a letter. So he, he wants you to know some things about the way he designed life to be lived. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, 
if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. In other words, if you have tapped into the grace of God, if you've been the recipient of his love, if he's answered your prayers, if he's ministered to you in any way, then use that as a motivation to be like-minded, to be one in heart and spirit. I think we drastically underestimate how important this particular thought is. You might be surprised by both the significance of, the beauty of, and the power of unity. And you might really be um, surprised by just how passionate God is that we live with this oneness of heart and oneness of mind, that we are unified. I think it's uh, probably evident by your own experience how difficult it is to achieve this unity that the Bible and God is calling us to live out. Unity is not easy. Unity is hard. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Tonto and the Lone Ranger? Come on, let me see your hands. Uh, you, you know, you, how many of you have never heard of Tonto and the Lone Ranger? Okay, a few of you young people. I, I took a poll from our staff and uh, all of the young people had no idea what I was talking about. Some said, are you talking about the baseball team in Dallas? <laughs> what? Tonto, the Indian sidekick of the Lone Ranger who was a famous uh, you know, lawman in the Wild West. They were, they were riding their horses in a canyon when Indians came on each side and they were painted for war and they were ready for battle. And the Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, what are we gonna do? And Tonto says, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> Unity is not easy. It's not easy in all the different spheres of our life. It's not easy in our family. It's not easy in our marriage. Uh, Laura and I have made no secret about this, that our first couple of years were really, really tough. And we're not just saying that, it was really true. If you ask Laura, she thought she married a judgmental, you know, perfectionist. I thought I married a crazy person. So we had some issues, but people would come up to us often and say, oh man, you guys are awesome together. You're like a match made in heaven. And I thought, yeah, like thunder and lightning. <laughs> Even Christians, at times, we have trouble with this thing called unity. There was a man who was uh, on a deserted island and he, he was shipwrecked. He was there for 15 years. And, and when the, a rescue boat was, was uh, searching, they finally found him and they, they came to shore. The captain came to shore and he, he, he saw the man and there were three huts on, you know, on the island and uh, they were right next to each other. And so the captain asked the man and said, uh, what are these three huts? And uh, he, he, he turned to the captain and said, the first one is my home. And the second one is my church. And the captain said, well, what's the third one? Well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> it's interesting how difficult unity is to attain, that unity is to, 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 to get in our lives. And that's why I think the apostle Paul was was focusing in on this important principle. Even though it's hard, I gotta tell you, it's worth fighting for. It's worth aspiring to. When you think about all of the ways that unity can be expressed, it's a value and an asset wherever it is experienced. Like unity in business. Uh, you can't read a book about business and business ownership and business success without coming across this principle of unity. If you were to go home today and Google how to be a business success, you might find you know, someone with a list of five keys, another one, 10 keys, another one, two or three keys. It doesn't matter how many keys there are. In one of those keys, they're gonna tell you how important it is to have a passionate workforce that is unified. In fact, 
One famous business quote goes like this. If you can get all of the people in your organization rowing in the same direction, you will dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. Unity is an asset for business. Unity is also important when it comes to the country's health. We have a phrase that's written on all of our currency, e pluribus unum, which is our country's motto, out of many, one. And there are many people from many different backgrounds that make up the, you know, the tapestry of American culture. But the ideal behind it all is that even though we are many with many different opinions and many different expressions, many different preferences, and yet unity, we are one. That's the goal. After 9-11, there was a there was a picture taken of almost every neighborhood in American society and the American flag was being flown with pride and passion. Uh, it took a tragedy to unify us. And yet, as the years have, have kind of rolled by one after another, we find ourselves maybe in the most divisive uh, season of our nation's history. And I'm praying that we will find some common ground again because we are Unified. When we are unified, we are stronger and better as a nation. Unity in family life. Um, I don't know if my parents were, um, were by design wanting a really tight-knit community uh, of brothers and sisters and family, um, or they, they happened upon it by, by accident or, or just fortuitous you know, kind of uh, outcomes. But um, my mom and my dad, they, they loved family. They created a culture of family. And, uh, and one of the things that we did growing up was uh, we went camping and every single uh, person in the family had a job to do to set up the camp. And we would set up the tents and we would set up the, the tables and, and put around the chairs by the by the. Uh, campfire and we would, you know, have to unpack the car. Everybody had a job and my dad had a stopwatch and we tried to beat the time that we did before to set up camp. And I can't remember what the record was, but something like 20 minutes, we got the whole, you know, camp set up. The benefit of that long term is now uh, one of the closest connections that I know of. And not everybody in my family believes the same way. Not everybody is a Christian. Not everybody has the same vocation. Some are educated, some um, not. But out of the five siblings and my mom who still survives us, we have this incredible tight-knit community and unity has made our expression of life better. Unity in the family is to be coveted. Unity in sports. Everyone knows that it's not the most talented teams that win. It's the ones that are most unified. There was a movie that came out. I don't know if it was very popular or not, but it was Boys in Water. It was the story of this junior varsity team that won a gold medal in the 1936 uh, Olympics. They were a rowing team. And what's interesting about rowers, it's not the strongest rowers and it's not even the most talented rowers that win. It's the team that is in the most sink that actually wins the race. And the rowers are not pulling against each other. They are pulling with each other. And the skill required to do that is unity. And that what is what is prized. Unity in church. I mean, it's, it's expressed in all kinds of different ways, but we had this wonderful time of worship this morning and, uh, and it would have never happened if the instruments weren't in tune with one another. 
And if there wasn't a leader who was expressing vision and passion for the worship experience, and we all got to benefit from it, but you may not realize that for a number of hours every Tuesday night, there is a group of volunteers and passionate people coming together to provide a worship experience for you. And they're unified in their passion to serve you. It doesn't happen by accident. Last year, last uh, week, we had nearly 60,000 uh, inmates at Shoreline Behind Bars view our service. Think about that, 60,000. That's almost filling, uh, you know, the, uh, the stadium where the Longhorns play <laughs> with people who are watching our, our service. And that doesn't happen by accident. Do you know that most of the uh, uh, of the technology here at our church is run by people under the age of 20. And Jake, Jake is 18 years old and he's the one that's deciding exactly which picture will be viewed for all of the streaming that takes place online to our South Campus, to Shoreline Behind Bars, an 18 year old who's working with a whole bunch of 20 and under teenagers that actually make the technology work, but they follow his direction. <laughs> Give it up for Jake. Unity is one of the most powerful forces in our society. When uh, in the Old Testament, they were gathering together to build a tower to the sky, the Tower of Babel, they were unified in speech and in vision and in passion. And God from heaven looked down and said, nothing will be impossible for them. In Psalm 133, verse one through three, it says, how good and how pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. God is passionate about cultivating it and sustaining it. In Proverbs chapter six, it highlights six things that the Lord hates. And you know, one of them is the person who sows discord amongst his brothers. God is not casual. I think sometimes we think, oh, oh, unity would be a nice thing to attain. It might be good, but it's not really a high priority in my life. Well, maybe you need to read Proverbs chapter six and recognize that God is passionate about rooting out things in our lives that cause disunity. John chapter 17 is a chapter in the Bible that records a prayer that Jesus prayed. The whole chapter is a prayer that was captured that Jesus prayed to his father. And the essence of that prayer, you can read it for yourself, is Father, make them one as we are one. Jesus was passionate about unity. When the Holy Spirit was guiding Paul to write the Bible, he described all of us together as believers, as his body. We are the body of Christ and it's fingers connected to a hand that's connected to a forearm, that's connected to the arm, the shoulders, the, the torso. We are connected. We are the body of Christ. And every one of us is important. Unity is vital, but it's hard to keep for a number of different reasons. Human nature, different opinions and preferences. We get tired. We get easily offended. And sometimes it's something as simple as a, as a misunderstanding. There was a lady that was trying to get on a bus and she couldn't lift her leg to to get onto the first step of the bus because her, her skirt was, was too tight and it was, it was hugging her legs together. And she smiled up at the bus driver and, and, uh, and said, you know, give me a minute. And she thought if she unzipped the back of her, of her skirt just a little bit, she would have the freedom to be able to move her leg and to step onto the bus. But she unzipped uh, her skirt and, and she tried again to no avail. She tried it two more times and she still couldn't get her, her leg to, to, to step up onto the bus. A tall Texan was standing behind her, just kind of grabbed her by the waist and lifted her easily and put her on the step. 
And she turned around and said, how dare you touch me? I don't even know you. <laughs> to which the tall Texan responded, I agree with you, ma'am, but I assumed we were friends when you unzipped my pants three times. <laughs> Unity is not always easy. <laughs> We're kind of like porcupines in this way. We need to get closer because of the cold outside. We need each other's warmth. But the closer we get, often the more wounded we are by the sharp needles that we poke each other with. And the Apostle Paul, knowing that human nature being what it is and God, knowing how important this principle is, guided the Apostle Paul to write some things that will help us cultivate unity in all of our relationships. And he actually says there are five things you need to know in order to be unified. The first, refuse to compete. In Philippians chapter two and verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition. Competition is not a bad thing when it's one team that's unified competing against an, another team. That's not, that's not bad. In that sense, competition can be healthy and good, but it's not good if you're competing with people on your own team. You don't want to be in competition with your spouse. You don't want to be in competition with your brother or your sister or your parents. You don't want to be in competition if you're in a business. You don't want to be in competition with other people in the same business where you crater the vision and the goal of the business for yourself to be promoted. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Some people never grow out of this kind of competitive thing. We grow up, you know, competing for toys or competing for attention. How many of you were always competing for shotgun in the car? I called it first. Some people just never grow out of it. They start comparing their whole life long, assets and titles and popularities and likes. And the Bible says it is unwise. One translation says it's stupid. So for all of our Spanish speaking congregation, it is el dumo <laughs> to compete with one another. Competition destroys unity. I would recommend that we change our mentality there's no place for this. Understand that we are all created in the image of God and that every single person is priceless, that we are all sinners saved by grace and that all of the good that we have in our lives is really good beyond our doing. If we would embrace that mentality, it would cause competition to diminish from us. We are not in competition as a church with other churches in town. There are so many life-giving, God-glorifying churches. We just want to be one of them that joins the chorus, that joins the mission of bringing the kingdom of God to this community. Our competition is not another church in town. Our competition is 6th Street. Our competition is, you know, the lake when it has some water in it. Our competition is, is late night Saturday gatherings that keep people out of fellowship with one another. Our competition is not other churches. Refuse to compete. Number two, resist pride. Philippians chapter two, verse three, do nothing from vain conceit. Do nothing from empty, selfish pride. Some of the biggest barriers to unity are our ego. We're too good 
to be a team player. We esteem ourselves in unhealthy ways. We've always got to be the smartest person in the room. We've always got to take the starring role and we don't understand just how much discord is sown by that kind of mentality and attitude. A me first. Maybe you heard this little quote, the guy who is too big for his britches will always get exposed in the end. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> that happened to me last Sunday. We were on our way home from South Carolina. My niece got married and so we were together as a family. And, uh, and Laura and Danielle, my granddaughter Nala and myself, we took the trip. And I got upgraded from coach to first class on the last leg of the journey from Dallas to Austin. And I didn't know it until I got up to the, to the check, check in. I, I, I put my phone that had the QR code, they scanned my phone and the lady said, well, you have the wrong boarding pass. And I knew what that meant because it had happened before. She said, I got another boarding pass for you. She hands it to me and sure enough, 6F, first class, baby. <laughs> and I got that boarding pass and I don't know what it was, just being a jerk, I guess. I just kind of waved it <laughs> in front of Laura and Danielle. And I had this goofy smile that I sometimes get. I can't control it. It's the same kind of smile I get when I get a really good hand in poker. And even though I don't gamble at all, sometimes we play poker as a family with no money on the line. I would lose all my money because when I have a good hand, my face does something funky that I can't control. And that's what happened when I got that boarding pass. My face did that funky, I am blessed and you are not. <laughs> While I was walking the, the plank, you know, to, that doesn't sound right, the boarding tunnel to get on the plane, I thought to myself, I should really give this to Laura. That thought did hit my mind. But then I thought, I don't want to tempt her because she was there to help Danielle with Nala on the plane and I wouldn't be as good a help on the plane with Nala and I didn't want to create drama. So I did the, the better thing. I kept the ticket for myself. <laughs> and I'm sitting in 6F and this seat right next to me has seat belts crossed over because there was something wrong with that seat. So not only am I in first class, I don't have to share my row with anybody. And I'm just thinking, this is God. This is favor. This is nice. And the flight attendant comes up and says, uh, can I get you something special to drink? And I don't drink alcohol. It's not a judgment. I just don't. But I do like club soda and cranberry just as an adult beverage. I never even drink it at home, but if I'm in first class, I want something fancy. So I asked for some club soda and some cranberry and she brings it uh, to me and I'm sipping my, my club soda and, and cranberry when another flight attendant comes over and says, uh, sir, someone who paid for a first class ticket showed up, you need to leave. And she said it with an attitude. <laughs> Not, I'm so sorry, Mr. Coke. We, we thought we could give you a seat, but we can't. It was like, you didn't even pay for the seat. You don't deserve this seat. Get out. <laughs> and I had my iPad out because I was going to read. And then I had the drink, but I also had a, a suitcase on the check-in above. And I said, I thought reasonably, I said, is there any way I could just leave my, my suitcase here because I, you know, I have to walk you know, back to you know, the peasant section. 
And the lady says, no, we're gonna need that for the paying first class passenger. So now I gotta grab my drink and my iPad and somehow wrestle you know, my suitcase out without spilling the drink. And the only seat left on the plane was the very last row. I had given up my relatively good seat in the peasant class, but now they had given that ticket to somebody else and the only seat left on the plane was in the very back row. And so here I am, I'm trying to balance my drink and I've got my suitcase behind me and it's almost like the walk of shame. (laughs) The whole plane is full. But the thing that took me by surprise was how much joy there was in Laura and Danielle's faces. (laughs) As I was walking by, they looked at me, oh my gosh. They didn't feel sorry for me. It was like, yes. Do you see all of the ways that pride can disrupt unity? They didn't have my back. (laughs) Do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from vain conceit. Then he goes on to say, humbly esteem one another. Philippians 2 and verse 3, in humility, esteem others better. C.S. Lewis has a famous quote, and I love this quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. If you want to be good at cultivating unity in your family, in your business, in your friendships, in church, stop thinking about yourself so much and all of the ways you want to be served. Esteem others. Often, instead of esteeming the people around us, we try to tear them down, especially if we perceive in some way that they're ahead of us. Our instinct is to criticize, to cut them down to size. Yeah, they're driving a nice car, but they probably have tons of debt. Yeah, she's attractive, but she probably wears way too much makeup. We might say congratulations on the promotion, but in our heart, what we're really saying is, oh, they're a kiss up. And we try to somehow cut them down instead of genuinely building them up, blessing the people around us, calling out the treasure in them. Winston Churchill said this. He said, where there is no enemy within, the enemies outside can never hurt you. Have the attitude and mindset that you redefine what true success is. Rejoice when your friends are doing well. Help others to be their best. Make it your goal in life to help other people become the best version of themselves. Pray for God to bless the people in your world. And then when God does, you could just secretly take credit for it. (laughs) Number four, think about what's best for others. In Philippians chapter two and verse four, it says, look out for the interest of others. From the original language, that word look out actually means to scope or to notice. Focus in on, pay attention to the needs of others. Pray for that skill. Maybe even after the service today, you might take a quiet moment somewhere uh, in the rest of the day or tomorrow morning when you're having your, your devotional time and say, Lord, I'm praying to get better at this, better at becoming aware, better at noticing the needs of people around me. When you do notice and then act in the best interest of the people around you, it will produce unity in your family, in your business, in your neighborhood, in all of the ways that matter in our church together. There's an African proverb that goes like this. If you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. And then let me close with this final thought. 
The Apostle Paul says, honestly, it's really about having the same attitude that Jesus had. Philippians chapter two and verse five. Let this attitude be in you that was in Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here is Jesus, our savior, our model, our example, to which God is saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to adopt the same mindset that Jesus had. He didn't demand his rights. He didn't stand up in front of people and say, do you know who I am? I'm the creator of the universe. No, his attitude was, I'm here to serve. I didn't come into this world to be served even though he was the most worthy to be served. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. You might be the husband in your family. You think you're the king of your castle. Listen, you, you are someone in that position to serve. You might be the queen of that home, but you're there to serve. You might be the business owner or you might be the newest employee in the organizational chart. It's all about serving. It's all about having the attitude of Jesus. He was willing to sacrifice his life for the benefit of others. And it's that spirit, it's that attitude that brings unity to every single setting. And listen to how this passage closes. It's almost as if God is saying, if, if you take others, uh, care of others, I'm gonna take care of you. He's saying, look at Jesus, he laid down his life. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. You take care of the people in your world, God will take care of you. And when you take care of the people in your world and unity is formed, oh my gosh, there is a strength, there is a beauty, there is a power, there is a significance that unlocks the way God intended for us to live. And whether it's in business, sports, church, family, friendships, alone, we are vulnerable. Unified, we are powerful. Alone, just one? Oops, sorry about that. easily broken, sometimes too, in friendship or business or church. <laughs> can be broken. I lift weights, by the way. <laughs> you get five, six, seven people together in unity. Nothing you can do to break that. Nothing you can do. And when that happens in family, in friendships, in business, and most importantly, in his kingdom, with his church, oh, if we are unified, nothing will be impossible for them. Amen. So Father, we're here. And this chapter started out just saying, Lord, if we've received any benefit from you, if we've ever enjoyed your presence, if we've ever had fellowship with you, ever had answered prayer, in light of the incredible love that you have for us, if we've ever received it, Father, then Maybe we just make your joy complete by being of the same heart, the same mind, unified. 
Help us, God, to do that. In Jesus' name. So I want to give you the opportunity here this morning, if you wouldn't mind just standing to your feet, to tap into the presence of God, to experience His presence for just a moment here. With nobody leaving early or moving around, let's just, like you heard early, let's raise our hand in, hands in surrender to God and victory for what He's done that we would walk out of here empowered to live out this beautiful expression of unity that God wants to bring to all the significant priorities in our life. Let's worship together.
Sometimes it isn't fear that conquers us, but it's our own pride. And I was standing there as we were singing this song. I felt the surge in my heart to remind you, don't let your pride stand in the way of your surrender. Don't let your pride stand in the way of your surrender. You see, this chapter 2 that uh, of Philippians that Pastor Rob was speaking about today says, Let the same bind be in us that was in Jesus, that did not count it robbery. He came down and He gave His life to conquer our sins. That same mind, that same humility needs to be in us as we choose to surrender to Him. And maybe today is your opportunity to surrender. Maybe today is your day to surrender to Him. So I wanna ask with every head bow and every eye closed in this room, I wanna invite you if today is your day of surrender, if this is your moment to accept what Jesus has done for you to forgive your sins and for you to surrender to Him, I wanna challenge you to have the humility today to say, Lord, I'm ready to surrender to You. I'm ready to give over to You. And if that's you, would you just put your hand in the air as high as you can so that we can pray with you today. I see those hands going up. Anybody else today that says, this is my moment to surrender. This is my moment to give up, to give over, to accept what He has done. Let's pray out loud and together. Lord Jesus, we believe that You have died for our sins. Thank You that I have a way to God. I accept You as my Lord and Savior. And I will live for you from this day on. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a great hand today. I want to invite the prayer team forward. And if you've just responded, I want to encourage you to come forward for prayer. We would love to pray with you today. In fact, if you have any prayer need, we would love to pray with you. You can also text the word forgiven to the number 97000 and we would love to reach out to you with some more information. I want to bless you as you go today from Numbers chapter 6 verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Have a fantastic week. Thank you for being with us today.